All right. So we're live. And thank you guys for joining. So another round of the True Blue Roundtable. And this time we're going to be talking about health. Uh, just to start us off, to get us in like the mood of uh, talking about health, um, I'm just going to read out the World Health Organization definition of health. And then I'm going to have our guests uh, introduce themselves and tell us how they're involved in, in the world of health. So according to the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, social, economic status, or condition. So with that, um, I have Stephen first over here in my corner. So let's just go with Stephen and then Davi, Luis. Luis, do you prefer Luis or Luis? Luis. Luis? Yep. And so please, guys, introduce yourselves. That's awesome, awesome. Well, my name is Steven Rodriguez. I'm, a, I'm an emergency medicine nurse practitioner here in the uh, Reading, Pennsylvania area. Um, also a med medical educator um, for uh, NPs, PAs, uh, physicians, residents, and things like that. I do a lot of procedural courses. Anything emergency related, relate, uh, emergency medicine related, uh, I kind of just teach them how to do it. Um, the reasons why and things of that nature. Um, teach a lot of CPR and advanced uh, life support courses as well, um, mostly for the hospital, but as well as for um, just regular community members um, that are also interested. Um, but uh, I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, happy to meet all of you guys. So um, Davi Thompson, um, I think from the last round table, everybody knows, but uh, I coach for weight loss and muscle building along for bodybuilding. Um, and that's pretty much it in bodybuilding since 2019. Um, I'm Luis Odaño. I currently work as a prep population health coach slash counsel um, counselor. Um, I work at Cooper Hospital. So what I mostly do is administer um, rapid HIV tests to everybody and more specifically help them navigate the overall healthcare system and more specifically how to remain HIV negative. Um, so that's pretty much the work that I do. A lot of the population that I work with is usually um, all kinds, all ages, old age to young age, homeless to top tier. So I work with a lot of different kinds of people all in efforts to prevent HIV and from ending the HIV epidemic. What's up, everyone? My name is Eduardo. Um, so I'm currently a psych practitioner. So I essentially help people with mental health symptoms achieve their goals, whether it be something such as like finding housing, getting back into the community, um, job applications, things um, of that nature. Um, and we also help them form independent skills. So the hope is once they're discharged from our program, they're able to kind of do things on their own um, and find that empowerment within themselves. I think you're on mute. You're muted, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I was about to say that uh, I love the introductions. And um, usually, I'm just the host, and I ask the questions. But I am a stakeholder in this field as well. Um, I work at the National Institutes of Health. I mainly work in research uh, having to do with the public health side of um, drug-related research on so things such as ep the epidemiology of um, drug use, uh, services, and prevention um, of drug use. So uh, my area, we help fund the research that helps the people out in the field do uh, the great work that they do to help our populations. So um, just to get us into it, uh, the first question I would like to ask anybody, and you guys can jump in, right? Like, so I mean, this is like I said, this is like a kickback. You tell me how you feel about it. So based on your perspective, what is the state, and we're going to start macro, of our society's health today? Health availability or just overall, like, individualized health? Like overall, how, how you feel that our population is health-wise? What is our state right now, you feel, oh. after seeing what you've seen in the field? <laughs> um, I mean, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. So I think uh, so it's a very loaded question, right? I yeah. mean, yeah. Uh, um, Start big, we'll get small. 
yeah, depending on like what community you're talking to or talking with or what population you're talking with, um, then it sucks, right? Um, or you can argue that overall, as a country, we have pretty decent health care, right? Overall. Um, but I, I definitely think that uh, certain populations definitely fall through the cracks. Um, just resources aren't as available or people just don't know that the resources are there. Um, even if they are available, it's just lack of education. And uh, um, so, yeah, like I said, it's very, very, very loaded. Yeah, yeah it is. I think, your best season. Yeah. yeah, I think Stephen almost like took the words out of my mouth because from the small time that I have, because I just graduated back in December um, of 2022, it's like a lot of gaps in like in terms of what people actually know and let alone like even with this the covid everything that happened with covid is almost like a literal blip of people yeah. just almost forgot what kind of resources are available in a community and it like makes me hopeful that there are people who come in to like care about their health and ask about their health but there's still like a lot of misinformation that's being spread in the streets even like specifically when it comes to hiv it's like people yeah. still think it's this death sentence and there's still this stigma and there's still this like cringe, this cringiness when it comes to the just HIV period. So I think there's mm -hmm. like a lot of gaps in education and you can sadly, from the population that I work with is mostly black and brown people. I'm like, we need it the most. <laughs> so it's, it's always like yeah. a constant struggle of like who actually is getting the knowledge and getting the information. And that's what I've been noticing with like the health and everything that's happening right now and how do you just to like follow up on like what you said how do you find people are getting this knowledge like at least in the population you work with sometimes it ends up having they end up getting the knowledge because they end up getting a call from the department of health like hey it's time to come into the clinic because <laughs> yeah. something came back positive yeah. um reactive so it's like it seems like once they're already in the situation that's how they're coming into the clinic, which defeats the purpose of like prevention and the main purpose of like healthcare, is trying to prevent our health so for us getting sicker. So it's always when they're in that dire situation that oh, they're finally getting this information when it could have been when it could have been prevented. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I agree with that one hundred percent. But I don't want to take the words. Like, I mean, what do you guys think? Because I saw you nodding heads right there it's, as he was saying, prevention is just missed and. 100% agree, but I kind of want to hear from you guys. Like, Ed, I saw you. Like, yeah. Oh. So I'll just say from the mental health perspective, um, there's what I've seen is like there's a lot of barriers to getting the proper mental health, whether it be things such as like, um, so, uh, places have like long wait lists, you know, so it takes them a while for them to get like a therapist or a counselor. And then some of these um, people, they lose faith, you know, in wanting to seek that mental health. It's like, you know, why, why go do this when it's going to take, weeks or months you know there's no point um other thing is when it comes to like kind of like insurance you know i know some places um, take certain insurance sometimes you have to change your insurance to like the county's insurance um so kind of like what was mentioned like the health systems are there it's just like they need to be improved a little bit better and so they can be more efficient for you know the 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 people who are in need of them um I feel like you know people like i said sometimes lose faith in the system because it's either too slow or things aren't happening right away yeah. absolutely and something i mean i keep hearing and it's in the front i mean definitely for us being latino men right or minority men most of us in the fraternity are not a lot i mean not a lot <laughs> like a lot rather um and it's right in our faces all the time so what do you think about the latino community and how we are as far as health because I, I heard think, barriers, I think, insurance, all a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I think culturally we're very, very bad at health, right? Um, and just to kind of almost like encompass all of our fuels together, like whether it be emergency, psych, weight loss. Um, as a Latino culture, we're really bad at it, right? From a very young age, you're mm -hmm. uh, you're co you're uh, emotionally deprived, right? Like you, as a man, you can't show emotions. It's not a it's not a very manly thing in the Latino mm -hmm. culture. Um, as it pertains to weight, if we're too skinny, mm -hmm. or oh, flat, if we're too fat, they're gold, right? Like we're always just stigmatizing uh, these things. 
But then I remember even as a young kid, I couldn't leave the table until my plate was was empty, right? Even if I was That's full. Huge one, yeah. Even if I was full, I had to eat the whole plate, right? That was just yeah. We, or if you of, didn't want to eat, you just sat there until like right, right. <laughs> entire so I, day went. <laughs> and, nothing, and nothing has changed, right? I mean, I think maybe us because we're significantly more educated, but I think if we're going downtown, like any city, right, where we're dealing with with the average um Latino, like the culture still remains where there's a huge stigma against psych, there's a huge stigma against uh uh weight, mm -hmm. um uh and yeah. everything, right? So I don't think we're very good at it. And I, and I deal with these cases very often in the emergency department where whether it be diabetes or psych issues or, or even uh, uh, HIV and AIDS, like there's just so much lack of education and, mm -hmm. and you don't get to give it to them until it's too late, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there's a lack of Latino um, and Spanish speaking uh, uh, providers out there, right? Like. Um, it's one of the things that I really pride myself in when I'm in the ED. Like I try to deliver the best care to my, to my and I hate to say my people, but I give mm -hmm. like, great care to everyone. But overall, I, I see the quality of care that they get from other people. And it's not that it's bad. It's just using an interpreter is an inconvenience. Now, what could have been a patient that you saw in five, 10 minutes turned into this 15, 20 minute ordeal. Yep. So they try to just finagle uh getting all the information from the patient in, this, in the broken english um yeah. and, and a lot of things fall through the crack and it's just unfortunate yeah. but the system is uh is very much flawed yeah i mean like when you said that about the interpreting right at a at an office and stuff like that there's so many things that fall through the cracks within the context of culture right you spend the entire first visit just explaining everything giving yep. like a story when instead you know like if you went to uh somebody who understands the culture already right you That's have right. to explain that part it's you it's already understood that this is kind of how for example how you were said like the the stigma of like being fat or like the stigma of like not talking about psychiatry or like mental health in our communities definitely no. definitely yeah and somebody Add to that, yeah. and even even to add to that, I think there's something that being raised mostly because I was raised here in America all of my life. I came here when I was like one and a half, almost two years old from the Dominican Republic. And something about being raised in American culture, you inherently understand like intersectionality and how things can affect one thing on the other. And sometimes when even speaking to for example undocumented patients sometimes who were to come in they just they just migrated over from their country over over here it's trying to connect the dots so they can see the full picture of why it's important to just be on this regimen or to be on this sometimes like kind of sucks because i'm like it, it works and you, it's supposed to be there and these are the gaps and this is how you connect it but sometimes like even myself my my spanish isn't the best and i'm like one of the only spanish speaking um practitioner not practitioners but one of the healthcare workers that are there yeah. and even my spanish can't hit every other dialect oh my gosh i think like yeah. that there's a lot of like disconnects and trying to connect the different identities and where we come from and how can i with all what i know speak this in a way that you can still take care of your, of your health and i think that's just a lot of gaps and disconnects when it comes to that as well it's a huge challenge right but then it also kind of makes you think is like why are you the only practitioner if, like most of the people that are going into your like <laughs> spot right <laughs> probably speaking spanish right okay so yeah that's another that's another thing i mean i i personally generally am kind of with y'all as far as like where we are health as a community it's not the best and usually we we I, I don't know what it is about us. Maybe it also is about men. Like, well, we can probably, like, that's probably a good segue because um, a lot of men, especially in our culture, are resistant to being told anything about how to live their life, right? Like, is, do this for your health. I uh, don't know. No, no, like, don't tell me what to do. It's like, what that's what I've seen in, like, some of the men in my family, right? Like, the older ones. So, I mean, how do you see men in this picture of health? Where are we? See, I don't, I don't, when I think about that, when you ask that question, I don't really like to divide it. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you talked about it, you went from a 
micro, you went from a macro perspective to a, um, you want to say micro to ethnic, and then you're going to gender. But yeah, in situation, I don't think it's a, it's a gender based thing. I think one, I mean, we talked about resources, we talked about education, we talked about um, having the people there to provide you the care, uh, depending on what area you're working in. But I think part of it is culture. Culture plays a big role in the U.S. Um, and a lot of, if you want to say, unhealthy uh, practices or um, routines are promoted today. Yeah. You know, you really can't say anything against a unhealthy routine where it's like you're being offensive or you're speaking out against someone, right? And so, you know, going when you talk about resources and education. Like I grew up where my mother, she didn't, she she made sure we didn't have cookies, we didn't have chips, we didn't have any of that. She she cooked everything. Um, she wasn't big on frying stuff. My father, on the other hand, cookies, chips, fried, all that other stuff, right? Um, but I that's what I received versus what the rest of my community received, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was fortunate to have that. But men's health, yeah, we could be stubborn especially going to the doctors. I think most men are stubborn going to the doctors, right? Um, even mental I, as well. I do think in all honesty that working in the, working in the, uh, especially, I mean, working in the health and fitness realm, um, mental goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and more than a bodybuilder, or sometimes you are playing a therapist role. Sometimes you're dealing with the psychological aspect. Um, where A, they weren't really prepared to come into what they came into. Yeah. B, that they they thought they were prepared and now it's like, I'm shocked at what's happening. So I don't really think it's a it's a gender thing. I think it's a I think it's more of a cultural thing. But I will say women are easier to work with than men. <laughs> women are easier to work with men. I think across the board on any field. Women, because you can just tell them and they will say, okay. Yeah. I think the big part of that is resources um, and just availability of resource. Um, and, and like in the, yeah, I kind of keep going back to obviously my field is all I really know, um, like in emergency medicine. And then let's just say something as simple as uh, male or female, they hurt their back, right, at work. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, if you don't rest, you're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. but they can't afford to rest, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I, I, I'll give you three, four, five days off work. I can't, right? I got to pay mm -hmm. my bills. And I respect it, right? Because, I mean, ultimately, I'm not paying your bills. It's easy for me to say, hey, take this time off. Um, but ultimately, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, like, who am I? Just a random dude. Like, hey, you need rest, right? Take that time off. It's just not realistic. Um so I, I think it, it really goes back to resource. And one of the biggest resources that we all lack is time, right? I mean, even this morning, I mean, today, like I'm on the way home, I haven't had dinner yet. I'm picking up the kids from my, uh, from my mom's. And it's like, oh, like, what are we gonna eat? Like, I don't feel like cooking at six o'clock when I get home, right? Like, so we just stop and pick something up. And obviously you can pick up healthier choices. And uh, I'm fortunate that I can do that, but most people can't, right? It's easy to go to McDonald's or go to Chick-fil-A or go here and go there and pay, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks for everyone opposed to like buying healthy organic foods, you know, like it's, it's, it's a huge gap in resources and uh, just time, right? Um, and we can talk in circles about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can fix it. I just, I, it's just a huge well, gap in resources. Um, yeah, it's what you see, right? Like mostly. As far as yeah. like bar barriers, that's yeah, like it's top, just, right? I mean, you're going to survive first before you <laughs> worry about something that's like right, years from right. now, maybe. Right? It is. It's hard. It's just, it's really, really hard for people to be healthy. Um, it's even like going to the gym, like for, for uh, like the rent, like the, the, the common individual that like is working 10, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. How do you fit the gym in there, right? And then how do you fit family time? So then you go to the gym, you spend an hour, hour and a half. So let's say you spend 30 minutes there, right? And that's 30 minutes that you can't spend with your kids, right? You already spent 12 hours away from them. 
So now you're mm -hmm. taking time away from your family to go to the gym to take care of yourself, which is very, very important. But now you're neglecting, not neglecting, but you're not spending time with your family. And then that has recourses in the future. So it's just a lot, a lot of barriers that um, we, we fail to see mm -hmm. um, sometimes, right? Um, and I try to sympathize, yeah. but it's, it's hard to fix, you know? I try to fix everyone, but it's hard, you know? That part. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you absolutely can't. I mean, um, so like, let's move to a new one because like you said, we're talking circles about like resources and like the barriers that there are and it's, we don't know the answer, but we know it's a problem. How do we do it? That's why we're here. That's why we're all working in it. Um, so based on your experience, what do you think most people overlook when it comes to um, how they can acquire health or how they can access health? They just don't know. Like, yeah. there's so much of this, you just don't know. And like, half the times, I don't know that it's even available. Like, yeah. and I, I had a phenomenal, well, that a phenomenal case learning wise for me, but not for the patient themselves. It was like an HIV case, right? Like, that I yeah. just had um, uh, had intercourse, condom broke, the other partner was known mm -hmm. to be positive. Um, so I give them all like the, the antivirals, et cetera. Um, but I didn't even know that we had this whole HIV department in our hospital that could give them like follow up and this and that. And I worked there, right? Like, mm -hmm. so let alone if I don't know, and I'm literally dealing with it, how does the patient, how do the patients know, right? Um, and that holds true for, for, for anything, right? Whether you're talking about high blood pressure or cholesterol or, or, or anything, you just don't know until you, you need it. And sometimes that's too late, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think there needs to be a lot more community outreach yeah. by, by hospitals, by, by clinics. And I don't know how to reach the minority population because it's hard because you can have all these events. We just don't show up, yeah. right? Um, and I hate to just like race this because I, I, I'm totally against like even individualizing different races, but I feel like every like other cultures and other races they do show up, right? And even if it's just for I don't know the free coffee and donuts, they show up. Um, but our people just seem to not, and it goes back to the resources, right? And 12 hours a day, how do you show up for these resources, right? I don't know. I don't. That's. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. No, I was gonna say I was gonna take it kind of back to health. I feel like one thing when it comes to our culture is like, of course, health in general. I feel like when you're raised, you know, a certain way, and I'm sure for us, like we had to like learn, unlearn certain habits, unlearn certain things in order for us to reach um, the positions we have in the health field. Um, but I feel like you know, certain habits are considered healthy. Um, you know, those communities, they grow up and they think this is normal, you know, go, you know, pushing their emotions aside, not eating enough, stuff like that. And so sometimes that's neglected to a point where they don't look for those resources, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that like, you know, one, it's just like what health is to, to everyone, like what that that view is. But also it's just like knowing, you know, what's what resources are out there. So I spend my time like being that guide in the mental health field, like showing this is the, the different supports that we have, you know, but sometimes like navigating that mental health field or the health field in general is can be confusing for, for the people who need it, you know, so I think it, it definitely, um, having those leaders within the health community, like being able to guide that, um, but also, you know, having those conversations, you know, and, and education again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even to add on to that, I think something I've been noticing not even just the people, but just the the system institutions themselves are overlooking the fact that there are a lot of diversity and a lot of changes and a lot of different communities that need to be addressed. Like what Stephen brought up, like the fact that there aren't certain departments communicating the way they should be communicating with each other. And then we're overlooking a whole population that actually needs to get the help. And I think that's something that I've been noticing that there is still a lot of work that these institutions that we work for, like need to catch up on. And I think we keep looking over, looking over the fact that the languages that are ultimately 
popular in the country are also changing. So we need to like change the digital signage and like the information and the healthcare information that we're getting out there. And I think just the overall branding and how healthcare is actually seen and these big old billboards and all the ads that we see scrolling down our phones, I think that's something that's often overlooked because sometimes like, hey, this service, I could benefit from this service, but I probably don't even think I qualify for the service sometimes. And I think that's something that's overlooked. And it's like, that's the main thing that I think that's been noticing that's pushing people away from even going back into health. I'm like, to begin with, this isn't supposed to be for me. One, because I lack the resources. And one, again, I don't think this service looks even like it's for me. So it's, I think that sometimes that I'm noticing more with the systems themselves than the people, because the people want the help. It's just like, why go look for it sometimes if I'm not going to be taken in by that system? I think that's why people just avoid coming into the healthcare or to just even the emergency room where a primary care provider to begin with. I'm like, what's the point if I don't really look like I belong here type of thing? Yeah. You know? on, on a positive note, like just question, has, has, have there been any programs that you've witnessed in your time in the field that have worked? That's something that we were like, oh, Crap, okay, like this, this is why I'm here. This, this makes sense. I mean, not so much programs. I'm, I mean, yeah. I've had individualized cases where, like, yeah, this patient's been in and out of the of the healthcare system, and yeah, nobody's listening correctly, right? And then finally, they get to me, and I'm speaking their native language, and I, and I figure out what it is because other people just weren't like. Not that they weren't listening, but it's just hard. Like, because I hate to say that other people aren't doing their job correctly. Because I don't think that's true. I just think the uh, I think healthcare has been created into a business where we're giving mm -hmm. these plots where I have to yeah. see a minimum of two patients per hour in the ER. I need to get them in and out in 180 minutes. I need to get them admitted in 240 minutes. If you're considered a low level patient, I have to get you out in 90 minutes. Now you're giving me these time constraints. Um, to figure out very complex issues mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at, at what cause at, at, at the quality of care, right? So then you have these non, let's say Spanish speaking or Asian speaking, whatever country that may be, or language that may be, or any other language, right? Well, now you have 180 minutes to order a bunch of tests, get results and get them out of the ER. Um, and then you want me to use a translator every single time that takes another 15, 20 minutes. So every conversation now is, a hundred percent longer than it was um, if he spoke English. So I, I think w we've uh, we created a monster in regards to making healthcare a uh, a business. Which do you, do you is, find it, yourself as a nurse like when you're in those positions where you have to like turn out patients? Do you feel like you kind of like? I don't know, you're doing arithmetic before you even talk to them, like, oh, like this is probably gonna take this long. This is gonna be this much. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, because the, the truth is that my raises are based on them, right? If I'm not hitting these goals, I'm not getting raises. So now I have to, so yeah. now you're financially straining me um, yeah. by these arbitrary numbers that I have to hit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's broken, it's definitely broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you guys, I mean, Stephen, I figure it may be mostly because, <laughs> like, nurses in general, like, we have a nursing shortage for a reason. Like, has fatigue affected you guys, or how, how have you seen like fatigue, like empathy, empathy fatigue in the health field? How, how, well, like, no, I think this relates to all of us, right? I think not just me. Um, yeah. it's, I'm also, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm doing more like, my job is not very straining, right? I sit at the table at, at a chair all day and I just tell people what to do. Um, it's very mentally straining, don't get me wrong. I'm like constantly mm -hmm. thinking and like, hey, like, what could this be? How can I fix it? And I just tell other people to do it. Um, so that can definitely be very fatiguing, but it does it does definitely take a toll on you and, and you start to lose a little bit of sympathy sometimes. Mm -hmm. and um, And sometimes I forget that people just don't know as much as we do, right? This is what we do for a living and we know a lot about it. Yeah. Um, and when somebody brings their two-year-old with a, a fever at two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, 
we'll just give them some Tylenol and see what happens in the morning. To them, it's an emergency. To me, it's, what, what are you doing here? Um, so it's sometimes hard to, when I try to really, really hard to like step back and say, hey, I know more than they do in regards to this, because I'm sure they know more about other things than, they, than I do. But in regards to this, I know more than they do. Um, take a step back and it's an emergency to them and therefore it's an emergency to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could definitely be easy to just say like, get very fatigued and yeah. uh, sympathy uh, sometimes. And I'm sure you guys witness the same thing too. You guys get overloaded and um, uh, I'm like Davi, I'm sure you will with weight management. I just got into medical weight management myself. Um, and sometimes it's hard cause I'm like, you know, apples are good and cheeseburgers are bad, but you keep <laughs> I shouldn't have to tell you this, right? But I, I but it's easy for me to say because it's easy for me to eat healthy. I, I enjoy yeah. eating healthy. Um, but seventy five percent mental, twenty five percent physical as it pertains to to weight management. Um, just wait to see if somebody had a comment. But yeah, no, it's I, it th that's probably as we were speaking uh, on it before, one of the greatest barriers is people that don't know even what to ask, right? That's like, it's one thing to not know something. It's another thing to like, absolutely not have no idea how to express inquiry. Like, just like, how, what, what is it that I should be asking? Right. With that being said, I, I mean, what do you guys think is like baseline, maybe something that like our community should know when it comes to asking about their health? I think part of that is going to be dependent. So in, I can really only talk about through my experience, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think part of that is going to be dependent that um, I think one thing that does need to get away and reformed is that food chart. Mm. Um, yeah. I think that's like, it, it kind of goes back to going back to what we talk about resources. I think the issue is just misinformation. Yeah, it's misinformation across the board. And so, like, Stephen brought weight loss management. There's a whole bunch of fad diets that people just see and say, oh, this worked for them. It may work for me. And or this is good. And it's like, no, it's not really good for you. And so I, it's misinformation. But in, in my case, on my side, the only way that can get fixed is, one, the government has got to change looking at um, – if you want to say health issues in regards physically, um, they need to look stop looking as a profit and more as of caretaking. Right. And I think that's that's the issues that I've run into is that it looks as a profit. Like you can't. I don't know Steve's awareness, but you can't just go to the doctor and say, "Hey, I wanna I wanna get my uh, blood work for my vitamin deficiency." You can't just do that, mm -hmm. or you can't just say, "I want my hormonal panel." which is heavy, highly important where I work in. And so what has to change is that it's the government cannot see it as profit. And if it's always profit, then on my side, it's really there's nothing I can do except tell you, like, you can get it from here, buy it from here, and you can get your blood panel that way. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll agree with that. I think another part that I've been noticing so far is, like, even though there are some questions that are like, sure about that, I think there's there's just isn't a wrong question. And I mm -hmm. think coming into health, we're, especially in this very health conscious society, especially through my Instagram and everything that I see, mm -hmm. is like, we're supposed to have all this information already. Like coming into the doctors, we're supposed to already know what is it that I'm going with, what is it that I'm doing with. I'm like, look, we're figuring out just as much as you're figuring out and we we're going to be able to figure this stuff out if you just ask and sometimes those questions or the hesitancy to just ask the question like hey i actually don't know this or just to say i don't know can you give me more and mm -hmm. for i think that's something that that we still just gotta keep working on because i think that's how we keep building upon the knowledge of like how can we both achieve healthy right what does that yeah. look like and have that question um, because like what Davi said is everything is separate, it's individual. And I think that's something that's really missing of this. We don't know everything and it's okay for you to ask. 
because that's what we're here for to make sure you don't fall back into the cycle again i really like that you mentioned that right like that it's a two-way street of like communication clear communication between the patient being okay with telling giving us the whole story right not just the patient the client whatever just trying to be healthy and giving us the as much information as possible so that the practitioner professional what have you can put the pieces together and find hopefully like a solution or resolution to like what can be done step forward and and so on that's yeah i see that all the time so i mean what have what has changed over time like from student right some of us like sooner like like, like recent graduates right others like we've been like out of school for a little longer and you know take classes and so, and so on but from the classroom to the practice what have you seen change how has your mind changed about health and how we can get more people to that state of health mm -hmm. i think it kind of goes back to what the v was saying a little earlier um i, I think education is very linearly approached you get these charts memorize these charts here's a test pass it and then you get to medicine and you're like oh well you don't fall into that box you're yep. like between these two boxes <laughs> well what do i do now right so um, many diagrams that don't work <laughs> so you get all these diagrams that don't work right exactly literally hit the nail on the head um and it's kind of understanding that that medicine overall regardless of your field is more of an art or or very part of it a big part of it is is, is more of an art than an actual diagram linearly approached algorithms um and and, and what works for one individual isn't going to work for every individual it might work for it might work for 90 percent of them and, and that's why we have a diagram because it most often works but then you get that 10 percent where it doesn't fit and and then we don't know what to do. Um, um, the fortunate thing is just to kind of be a little bit more optimistic about health. I think we're in a in an era in in our in our in life where everything's available to us like that, right? If you literally go on Chat GPT and just type in X, Y, and Z, and you get the answer, right? Or you want to watch eighty TikTok videos on the con content by actual professionals, you can't, right? Um, or YouTube or whatever. So that is one of the positives where we do have a lot of educational resources available to to us even though not all of it is 100 percent accurate um but it is available to us um a lot more than it was before that it was for our parents um and our grandparents where you literally had to go to the library right like now it's almost information overload where it's a little dangerous sometimes um yeah. but i think it's i think patients are more informed um and I'm not, I, I don't, I don't get upset when I get challenged, right? When a patient just comes, brings like, hey, I saw X, Y, and Z, what do you think? Um, and I'm, I'm totally for that, right? Because then I could educate them in the right way. Hey, this is why I don't really think this is the right path. Um, or this is why this is a good path, right? Um, so I kind of, we, as the hair, uh, healthcare professionals, we can kind of be more the mediator of yeah. this information. Um, rather than being insulted that other people yeah. know what we know now. So um, there's definitely positives to it. Yeah, I was going to say um, one thing I learned, or a few things I learned from going from student into the actual field is like, I feel like when you're a student, you're learning a lot of the theoretical stuff, you know. Um, but going to the actual field, I'm seeing how it applies to you know, the society that we live in, the community we live in, um, at least from my perspective in the mental health field, I used to work as a crisis counselor, which essentially is um, a suicide hotline, but more than that. So we come out to the houses sometimes and we can um, refer them to a level of care. Um, so one thing I learned is like, when it comes to like the mental health field, I'm like, all right, what's the step of like, I'm feeling this way, I want a counselor or anything beyond that. Um, a lot of it is based on things such as like, what symptoms are you experiencing, but also what's the level of safety, you know, like, are you, do you feel unsafe? Is it more so general thoughts or is it to the point where you're like, you want, you have a plan and action? Um, depending on that, you know, if you're just having, you know, anxiety, depression, things that you can, like you're having trouble managing, that's when we refer you to like an outpatient therapist or intensive outpatient therapist. Um, and between that, it's kind of like a, a partial program, which is essentially like you feel 
in a way unsafe, but like you haven't thought of a plan yet. So you might need to get away from the environment that's triggering those negative feelings. So they go to a day program, um, get counseling, get um, group counseling, and then they come back to the home. And of course, and I'm sure, um, you know, Stephen, you've dealt with this, is like the highest level of care is like, you know, hospitalization when they feel unsafe, when they're a threat to either themselves or another person. Um, they can either voluntarily go to a hospital or they can they um, involuntarily go to a hospital. So I think it's um, it's interesting to see like where those dynamics are. And it's like, I feel like as people educate themselves on things such as like mental health and like where they're at, that can help. But like, you know, that's something I learned in the job, you know, like not everyone gets that type of education or that knowledge unless you have someone who's in the field or, you know, have that support, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. That's the. I feel like we started the conversation on this point, right? That it's kind, of, it's it, it's it, it, this part sucks. It's uh, not having the information, and if you can get the information, usually you're at a better place, right? Where like in life, right? Generally, those people who can find the um, the information have the resources time as steven said being one of the major ones like who has the time to just sit down read like a research paper on this new medicine that this i heard on TikTok, right like this has been like the, the narrative now right <laughs> we, uh so i mean going on to that part we were speaking on profit in the health field yeah um have you guys what have you seen in policy what any open yeah <laughs> Luis, your eyebrows immediately were just like oh geez, man. uh why so yeah just even again specifically within hiv there's this quota that we have to hit because the policy itself says if we don't reach this certain amount of patients coming in back the grant that we're giving you is going to be taken away <laughs> so it was like literally yeah. We're playing with people's lives, but also playing with my paycheck, but also with the stability of the overall clinic, but then also with the hospital. <laughs> so it was like, so it's actually everything all at once. So you're like, you're thinking about all these things. And it's, I think sometimes with the policy itself, um, it's a little more background. I studied health policy administration back at Penn State. That was my major. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this policy works, but we still are leaving out like 75% of the population that this policy was supposed to help. So it was like, how can we also like loop in? It's like literally trying to lasso everybody in. So, okay, make sure this policy fits, make sure this thing fits, make sure this thing fits. Um, and sometimes it's just, it sucks because we also have to remind ourselves that the policy has to be just, just plain general language because if not, then we're going to just keep siloing communities. And the last thing we want to do in healthcare is silo, um, because ultimately this population is what's going to keep the thing funding and the thing, the, the program functioning. So it's like keeping, it's like trying to bridge these gaps while the gap is still like dripping or we're trying to the visualization is going on. My head is going like this right now. But it's like we're trying to catch so many things, but there's like still yeah, everything falling through. Lines. Catch um, and yeah, I'm not sure if you have anything on to add on to that. But sometimes the policy is our best friend, but also not a but also our an enemy at the same time. It's like trying to balance both worlds when it comes to that. Damn. But I still like the policy, though. I still like the policy. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, I mean, um, yeah. in the public health field for the time that I've been, um, policy is our greatest tool, yeah. right? Like, if, if we want to affect the most lives with minim, minimal, right, just in quotations, minimal <laughs> effort, um, policy is the way to do it. Policy can change the health of an entire community overnight if it's done correctly. And like you said, you know, the stakeholders are thought of. Right. and the people are spoken to and the people themselves are involved in that policy and there's so many things that are not part of the usual equation that's why i feel like there's so many places that we could um 
move forward and gain, but I don't, you know, I don't, not, not yet. We haven't, we haven't learned yet. Yeah. The full thing. <laughs> but we're on our way. So, I mean, I feel like we've touched on it, but if, if anybody else wants to add on it, like being what is the greatest concern that you have for our health moving forward as you see it today? I think the biggest, like, what was the question again? The biggest. Your greatest concern. Concern. Yeah. Well, this, is, this is monetizing health. Um, is. Mm by far I think the absolute biggest flaw in medicine um, is that it's monetized and it's not competitive um, oh that's a big one can you elaborate actually on that a little bit like that it's not competitive oh for sure like I mean you might have two hospitals that are literally a block from each other and you don't know what you're paying for what so an x-ray of your foot might be three hundred dollars at hospital X and it's six hundred dollars at hospital Y but you don't know that and you don't not only do you not know the price but you don't know the reason why and, and, and no one can explain that to you but they can just charge whatever they want um yep. pharmaceuticals i mean one of the biggest things that i encounter right now is like with like weight loss medication that can literally change people's lives and um make them healthier individuals in addition to obvious nutritional counseling and, and exercise um Pharmacies don't want to cover it. I mean, uh, insurances don't want to cover it, right? So everything's being monetized, right? So um, I have clients that are very, they have great insurance and they pay $0 for medication. And then I have other clients that it'll cost them 1200 bucks a month. And it's like, how do you, how do you help them? Like you can't, I mean, I can't say, well, if you take this medication, I can definitely make you lose weight and, and be healthier, but you got to pay a mortgage a month to, to take no way. The, right? So we've monetized it it's not competitive because you can't you can't get insurances from from the state various states so i think it should just be this huge open markets that make insurances compete against each other right now we have this very demographic um i mean geographical approach right where if you're like in the north northwest of pennsylvania you have upmc if you're in the south uh, west you have i don't know Aetna or some other um, some glamour, right? So they're they're individual, like individually contracting with each other. Hey, we'll take this region. Don't fuck with us. We'll take this region. Don't fuck with us. And then they can do whatever the hell they want, right? Because there's no there's no that wild then. <laughs> literally Isn't the wild wild. wild. Like, literally, yeah. and you can't even get mad. Like I mean, you can, but it's like it's smart. Like from a business perspective, it's smart. Like the policy allows them to do that. They're not breaking oh, the law. Oh, they're not right. They're not breaking the law. That part. But, but if I can get insurance from New York or get insurance from Tennessee, now it's competitive because now, well, they're not. They're leaving the state now. They're going somewhere else to get insurance that's cheaper and equal coverage. But it doesn't. Not, we're not allowed to do that, right? It's not. It's not no. possible. It's not competitive. It's just you're just monopolized areas. This and turf, it's turf wars. Yeah, it's, it's turf wars, and you're playing with people's skill. It's mm -hmm. legal. It's the mafia, but legal. You know. Um, yeah. and, um, and the thing is, you can't leave. Don't get me wrong. You can, you can, you can cross the turf, but then you add a network. And who can yep. afford that, right? Yep. So now you can't even get better care somewhere else. Let's say that you have a better hospital somewhere else. You can't go there because you're out of network, or unless you have the money for it. And then now we're just going back to resources right um because who's going to be able to pay 20 percent out of pocket of 100 grand for exactly. or whatever yeah, it's, you know it's a whole bunch of stuff i mean like you break your hand right and you can only find you can only co get covered for a knee specialist so like what you do you fucking get the guy who does the knees to do your hand <laughs> like what, what? <laughs> come on man no, i yeah I, I see i see that 100 percent. i see yeah. 100 all the time and I think even added on to that, um, one of my concerns is mostly just the next generation of like, what are we, what information are we ultimately passing down for the next generation so they don't repeat the same cycles? Mm -hmm. I think that's just one of my main concerns of like, who's taking care of the kids? Because <laughs> they're going into the system. So it's, I think, I'm gonna keep it simple with that one, just like who's 
looking out for the for the kids because once we're done you know i think in life life is going to be better moving forward i think once we get our parents out of leadership and get our grandparents out of leadership it's us taking over we're whether you're republican or you're a democrat or you're left or you're right i think we're just significantly smarter than our than the past generation and it's because we yeah. have more it's, it's just more information it's just more information right, right? Less bullshit. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's just, I, I think the past generation stuck with uh, this is just the way that we've done it. Yeah. And we're going to keep doing it that way. And I think our generation is not afraid to, to hurt feelings and to change things. And I think the future is going to be positive. I'm optimistic. Yeah. I love that. Because this is a perfect segue, too. That was That's actually like the question that I kind of wanted to round everything on is what are you optimistic about when it comes to health? You already mentioned, you know, like the, the amount of information that we have now, that's a huge one, right? Like significantly more well-informed than our parents could ever have even hoped to be. Like, I mean, right now we live in, in an era where the average Joe, if you will, can figure out everything just with a click of a button, right? The average Joe can, we're generally like the same information as somebody who is rich back in the day, right? Would have like yeah. resources. We have a smartphone. Knowledge is the greatest resource. You have yeah, what, yeah. What else are you optimistic about? I think that if you want to add on it, yeah. it might be a, the way it's sword because um in one sense you have everything in the palm of your hands but not everything that you are getting is correct that's true and so like yeah i've news that they that they have access to more resources that there may be access to more information education but at the same time um i think we have much of what i've encountered is People see something, believe it, don't look at where the source is coming from. <laughs> right. And so that last part, right? Yeah. And so that's that's the problem that runs people see it and they don't look at the source, but it's it's more of where are they getting the information from. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's I, I hope what did you say, Stevie? I said that's where we come in, right? Because other I think soon we would be unemployed, right? Otherwise. Right, because we're no longer giving the information; they're getting it on their own. No, we're we're the fact checkers, though, and that's how we. Because <laughs> otherwise, otherwise it's chat GBT. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> never lies. <laughs> what I do, what I do hope is that the healthcare does become less competitive, though. Um, is because people are today which i think is a smart thing to do they are very hesitant about med medication depending on what they have um and looking more into natural resources to be able to get some things down so uh that's a good thing but i hope that and i know this is probably one of the sides that steven works with i hope that um particularly i know it happens more with men than women i hope that insurance can be used for hrt clinics um, because that would fix much of the, if you want to say that would be a better substitute than some of the medication that doctors give them to fix hormonal issues, especially for women. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit with the HRT clinic? So a hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Hormone replacement therapy. So I, I have seen from like, I, I have a HRT clinic that I get my prescription through. I have seen where um, you have women that are going through depression or anxiety and doctors are just chalking it up that you're going through a mental mental crisis or mental issue. Um, when it could be A, the thyroid level is down or B, um, that their estrogen or testosterone is down. And if we can, if they get the medication that's needed for it, their mental health goes back up. Hmm. It, it's not hmm. it's not a depression or anxiety issue anymore um it's more that whatever was causing that is cleared which normally it's a it's a hormonal thing i i see it within the body boom community when you cut down certain bio level fats you get sometimes depressed hungry angry or tired 
Yeah, it's impressive, the chemistry. And so if women, I say particularly women, men, we as they get older in age, testosterone decrease. Um, but more with women and not even at 50 or 60, at 20s and their 30s, where they have these hormonal changes that they actually need solutions to. Mm -hmm. I'm actually so, in the middle. Of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, in addition to my weight loss, I'm going to add uh, uh, HRT very soon to my practice, my concierge practice. Yes, man. Put the plugs, eh? <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, it's just kind of feed off of that. It's just the average 70 plus percent of the 30 year old men have low T and you just don't know it, right? Your sex uh, drive is down. You're tired all the time. You're angry. You're moody. And your testosterone is up. And that's 30. We're talking a 30 year old man. Wow. Um, so 30. Oh, okay. 70% of 30 plus year old men have low testosterone. And you just don't know it. And it might just be a little bit where it's not affecting you too much. Um, but the vast majority are, are, are low. Um, but kind of just to kind of feed into what he was saying is uh, it's almost impossible to get it covered by insurance. So very often have to go through like compound pharmacies and things like that. Um, that finding a good one is hard, right? Because it has to be regulated um, by the FDA. Um, and not just some like Joe Schmo or some random sending you like horse hormones. Um, but then like it's hard. It's hard, it's hard to find a good quality uh, uh, material. Mm -hmm. uh, but the insurance won't cover it. And then there's, there's a stigma then in, in medicine to use compounded materials, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even though you're you're reaching more patients, you're making medicine more affordable. So now there's a stigma so that's not equally as regulated by the government. Um, but fuck the government. Interesting. It's, it's, it's a to say that the government at all. <laughs> So wait, uh, is it fair to say that, I mean, something that uh, excites you about the future of health, that's maybe the decentralization of it? There you're there, as far as happens. like more like different things. Huh? I hope that happens. Yeah. <laughs> as long as profit is involved, you may not have that with particularly HRT, because I most people don't get they don't get sick off those things so there's no profit in it right gotcha. um, oh, that's, so i was gonna say i feel like one thing that to look forward to is i feel like when it comes to to health people are like at least the younger generation they're becoming more aware of it and realizing mm -hmm. it's an issue it's just more so what information are they kind of being fed you know i feel like the younger generation like they love information, but it's like, where are they getting from? You know, TikTok, yeah. and other things, you know? Um, there's this term in psychology called like their schemas. So basically if you're exposed like to enough things to a certain time, like your brain will just adapt to it. So let's say like um, for the Latinx community, for example, like if you're raised around people who see machismo as like a thing that's normal, you know, you're eventually gonna you're, like, think like that's a normal thing. But if you're surrounded by people who eventually break that schema, like letting you know, like, hey, you know, you got to treat people this way, you got to be this way, you don't have to be my them all the time. Eventually, that scheme breaks, and you're able to open your mind to different ways of thinking. I feel like this might not be like a short term solution, but like in the long term, it's the hope that now that we're aware of it and we have that information, we have people to kind of hold other people accountable and to break those schemas. So it's like we'd get to where mental health and health in general is is talked about it is considered um i feel like we're in the long game where we just need enough people to to talk about it and or educate people about it where it becomes normalized so yeah absolutely gonna break those schemas and i am cognizant of time and we've reached it so i mean this was great guys i really i really enjoyed just talk, like it didn't feel like an hour to me it like uh -uh if it flew so i mean i really enjoyed like picking your brains i always enjoy talking to you guys always enjoy seeing my brother's faces and ones that i haven't seen in a long time steven i, I think the last time i saw you was a cobra party years ago when i was like a fresh neo so i mean yeah oh, long time ago, <laughs> we're not gonna age yourself anymore but <laughs> yeah it was a minute um but yeah guys uh thank you thank you and yeah thank you for having us thank you yeah, thank you. Yeah, and everybody out there, stay healthy. So I'm going to stop the streaming. And...
Cool, guys.